confounded fog. Makes the matches so damp, you know. Ah, there we are. This, of course, is London. And I am William Castle. Oh, it's good to see you again, my homicidal friends. This time, our story is of a different kind. It's an old-fashioned story, full of gallantry and graciousness and ghouls. You know about ghouls, don't you? They are, well, let me find you an exact definition. Let me see. Ghoul. Oh, that's an odd word. It means to search for game in the dark. Ghost. Ah, oh, here it is. Ghoul. An evil being who robs graves and feeds on corpses. Ah, yes, just an old-fashioned story. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope your nightmares are nice ones. So nice to have met you again. Oh, good morning, Doctor. Why don't you stay a moment? You might find this very interesting. Very well, Wainwright. Apply the heat. Yes, Sir Robert. Exactly 30 seconds, Wainwright. No more, no less. Quite, sir. Well, that doesn't hurt, does it, my dear? Oh, no, Doctor. It's nice and warm. Then we resume the massage. Good. That's all very well, my good man. Sir Robert Cargrave can't possibly see you now. But uh, the, this letter, my master told me to place it in Sir Robert's hand and in no other. I will give it to him. No, 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 only to Sir Robert. Sir, I assure you I will place the letter in Sir Robert's hands immediately he is available. Now, if that does not please you, perhaps you'd simply rather leave. No, 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 no. My master would... Now, now, listen. If I give you the letter, do you promise? I promise I will place it in Sir Robert's hand. Try doing that yourself. Oh, but Doctor, I couldn't. She's never been able to do that, Sir Rob. Come, come, you must try. Ha, ha, ha. 
Good girl. I did it, I did it. It worked, Sir Robert. Your treatment worked again. Yes, thank God. Bless you for this. Bless you for this, Sir Robert. You can take her home now, Mrs. Higgins. Keep up the exercises I told you, and I'll see you again next Tuesday. Come, Wainwright. Let's see if the post has arrived. The post, Sir Robert? Oh, yes. The new instrument from Scotland. Sir Robert, in yesterday's class, just before you dismissed us, you said something rather odd. About a poison that might cure certain forms of paralysis? Yes. Nothing odd about it, Wainwright. Frequently, the most deadly of poisons can also be the most beneficial of medicines. Such as belladonna. Quite right. Fatally toxic, but very useful in treating the ailments of the optic nerve. But it was not belladonna to which you referred yesterday. Uh, no, it was... Oh, sister, has the post arrived? Uh, yes, Sir Robert, a number of letters. Ah, uh, good. I'm expecting a package from Scotland. Oh, I do believe there is a package from Edinburgh, sir. Um, uh, yes, oh, so Edinburgh, is, that's sir. right. From Dr. Wood. Ah, here it is. Look at this, Wainwright. The original theory was put forward two centuries ago or more at Oxford by Dr. Christopher Wren. But only recently, through development by my friend Dr. Wood of Edinburgh, has it at all seemed practical. There, isn't that beautiful? Yes, very beautiful. You see, Wainwright, it is nothing more than a syringe attached to a needle. An ordinary needle? Oh, no, a very extraordinary needle indeed, a hollow needle. A hypodermic needle. Hypodermic? In other words, it is meant to puncture the skin. Correct. And carry healing drugs directly and immediately into the bloodstream. Ingenious, sir. Directly, Wainwright, immediately. Those are the two key words. Uh, Sir Robert. Sir Robert, may I call your attention to a letter? No what... more detours for the digestive system. Yes, sir. Uh, what is it? By special messenger, Sir Robert. It appears to be from the continent. Oh, well, it can... Now, wait a moment. I wonder if you'd leave me alone for a moment. Of course, Sir Robert. I must be running along at any rate, sir. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Wainwright. But my father forbids our marriage, Robert. He says you will never amount to anything. I must marry a man of substance, he says. A certain wealthy widower. Sister! You called, Sir Robert? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Would you do something for me? Why, of course, sir. Cancel my appointments, all of them. For how long, Sir Robert? I don't know, indefinitely. And would you please arrange transportation to the region of Gorslava, Central Europe? Gorslava? Uh, yes, sir. How soon do you wish to leave? Soon. As soon as I possibly can. There is no coach that will take you in the direction you speak of. The country up there is wild and mountainous. The roads are bad. Some places there are no roads at all. I'm afraid you don't understand me. I was to be met by a private coach. A private coach? From those parts? Nobody lives up there. But I assure you, somebody does. My host, Baron Sardonicus. Sardonicus? Yes. What do you know of him? Nothing, sir. I know nothing. I said nothing against the Baron. Did I, sir? 
No, of course not, but the mention of his name frightened you. No, no, not at all. Come now, don't dissemble. Why were you frightened? Ugh, sir, you would not understand. You are young. You do not yet have daughters. Sir Robert Cargrave? Yes? I'm called Krull, your humble servant. It was I who brought you a certain letter some weeks ago. Ah, then you're in the service of the Baroness. I'm in the service of the Baron, who is most eager to meet you. Shall we go, sir? Please. After you, sir. My dear Sir Robert, it has been a long time since last we saw each other, and I wonder if you will remember the former Maud Randall. I am married now, as you know, and live in Gorslava with my husband, the Baron Sardonicus. I have often told him of you and your researches, and recently we have read of your being knighted. The Baron has expressed a desire to meet you. Indeed, it is most urgent to my well-being that he meet you. Most urgent to my well-being. Most urgent. Most urgent, most urgent, most urgent, most urgent, most urgent, most urgent, most urgent. Not this way. Oh my God. What is the meaning of this? They're only leeches, Sir Robert. I know what they are, but why? And among our people, they're supposed to cure certain afflictions. Which doctors nonsense she might have died or been disfigured. Thank God I saw her in time. And what is her affliction? Her affliction? Oh, none, sir. None. Bastard man, explain yourself. Well, she is. Do you not, in your own work, make use of what you call guinea pigs? At whose bidding was this done? Why, the master's, of course. Baron Sardonicus. Well, there is no other master here. I'll take up the matter with him. 
Meanwhile, untie this poor girl. See that she rests. Give her brandy and a juice of red meat. I'll treat her face presently. Just as you say, sir, Robin. Now, <laughs> the Baroness awaits you. The salon is over there. Robert. Baroness. No, please. You must call me Maud, as you did in the old days. These are not the old days. Maud. That's much better. Now, come sit down and tell me all about yourself. Do you miss London? Oh, we're quite cosy here. We receive all the current journals and illustrated gazettes. I order all the latest fashions from Paris, the most recent musical scores from Rome and Berlin, all the most popular novels. Do you not find Mr. Conan Doyle a most fascinating writer? Then you do not, Miss London. I did not say that. But tell me how you have fared in the world. Oh, I have fared well enough, perhaps better than I deserve. My researches have been fruitful, my name is well known. I've been made a knight at rather an early age. And love? <laughs> oh, that, I'm busy night and day. The clinic, my classes. Writing papers, experimenting, making speeches. Oh, come now, Robert. You're suggesting that you have no time for love. There have been no others, Maud. Oh, Robert. You must be tired from your journey. Yes, and rather the worse for dust. We will dine soon. In the meantime, Krull will show you to your chamber so that you may refresh yourself. I will ring for him. You wish something, my lady? Yes, would you show Sir Robert to his rooms, please? At once, my lady. Until dinner, then? Until dinner. You're puzzled by the empty frame, sir? Yes, they do seem rather strange. The Baron is an unusual man of unusual conviction. In such frames, ordinary men would honor the portraits of their forefathers. But the Baron has disowned his forefathers in one magnificent gesture. Chamber, sir. I trust you'll find things to your liking. If not, well, I'm sure I will. Oh, uh, the maid servant. I must treat the leech punches on her face. Uh, she's resting, sir, as you advise. I've taken the liberty of treating her face with hot compresses and a disinfecting tincture. Ah, excellent. So you're a man of medicine, Crow. I'm a man of old work, sir. When my master says, Kral, do this thing, I do the thing, whatever it may be. Oh, that's most commendable. Thank you, sir. Now I am a bachelor and live all alone, and I work at the weaver's trade. And the only thing that I ever did wrong was to woo a pretty, pretty maid. I wooed her in the summertime and in the winter, too. Who is it? It's Anna, sir. I must speak to you. Just a moment. Ah, it's you, girl. How are you feeling? You, you won't tell them I spoke to you, sir? Very well, but... But they'd punish me, they would. Rubbish, but I won't tell them all the same. 
Now what do you want? Sir, you won't let them do that to me again, will you? Please promise you won't let them. You have my word. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Now that you are here... Yes? Now that you are here, sir, maybe the experimenting will stop. What do you mean? No more, sir. I must not be found here. I hope uh, the maid servant wasn't making a nuisance of herself, sir. Oh, no, not at all. Uh, Carl, what is that padlock door over there? I cannot tell you, sir, for no one but the master has ever been on the other side of the door. It's the only key. Uh, the servants call it the Chamber of Horrors. <laughs> a gesture. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. And so, you see, we do very little entertaining. My husband hates throngs of people. Maud. Yes? In your letter, your rather odd letter, you said that my presence here was urgent. Urgent to your well-being. What did you mean by that? Did I say that? How foolish of me. I suppose what I simply meant was that I longed to play the hostess again, to see a familiar face. No, Maud, you meant more than that. But what? I'm sure I really don't know, Robert. Very well. But your castle is no ordinary castle. The townspeople fear your husband and... Oh, Robert, I think you exaggerate. Perhaps. But I'm very anxious to meet the Baron face... Sir Robert Cargrave? Yes. I am Baron Sardonicus. It's a pleasure to meet you at last. The pleasure is mine, sir. Shall we be seated? My mask disturbs you, Sir Robert? foolish of me to deny it. Quite so. It is an idiosyncrasy of mine, but a necessary one, I assure you. Later, I will tell you the reason for it. Meanwhile, please sample our poor fare. Not poor at all. It looks delicious. But are you not joining us, Baron? Just a little brandy. I have already dined. If that will be all for now, my lord, I should attend to a little servant problem. Yes, that will be all, Crow. Robert? Sir Robert, do tell us what's been happening on the London stage. Well, let me see. Um... Ah, there you are. Waiting for me like a good, obedient girl. Oh, please, please. But you're not always obedient, are you? Please, Paul. We must have a little talk, Anna, you and I. You and I and some friends of yours. Some little friends of yours. No! No! Not the leeches again! That is 
Help not. <laughs> but you see, <laughs> you are very naughty girl. I expressly forbade you to speak to Sir Robert. Yet yeah, you spoke to him. That is too bad of you. I didn't. I, I didn't speak to him. Lies now. First disobedience, then lies. Come now. Tell me what you said to Sir Robert. I said nothing. You must tell me or it will be the leeches again. No. Please, no. Yeah, so thirsty, the little fellas. So thirsty for the sweet nectar that flows in your veins. Oh, no. <laughs> but this time, they will sip the nectar not only from your face. This time, the leeches will get better acquainted with you. <laughs> there are so many of the little fellas almost eager to know you better. <laughs> they will cover you from your face down, the whole length of you, all the way down to your toes. <laughs> no! No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't do that, Quill! Perhaps it should be reversed. Hmm? You should begin with the toes and work up. Hmm? Yes, 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 yes. No! 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 I'll tell you! I'll tell you! That sounds like a most interesting season, Sir Robert. Particularly the revival of Macbeth. But then Macbeth is such a totally evil character, is he not? I've never thought so, actually. Better say a man pressed into evil by circumstances. On the other hand, there is a Iago, a creature of pure evil with no redeeming qualities, who tormented Othello with, with ghoulish delight. Ghoulish, you say? That is not a term to be used lightly. A ghoul, as I'm sure you know, is a disgusting creature who opens graves and feeds on corpses. Are you suggesting that Iago did that? My dear, I'm sure Sir Robert used the term figuratively. Ah, perhaps so. And of course, the English do not believe in ghouls, do they, Sir Robert? Well, no, I... No, of course not. But in my country, we do believe. In fact, Sir Robert, in fact, I have known a ghoul. Indeed. Ah, you English, nothing shocks you, does it? You are so blasé. Or can it be that you do not believe me? It would be discourteous to doubt the word of one's host. And an Englishman may be many things, but never discourteous, eh, Sir Robert? Let me tell you about this ghoul. Yeah, here, yeah, Master. I will be there presently. Thank you, sir. Perhaps we might finish our discussion on ghouls some other time, Sir Robert. But of course. I have visitors, very important visitors, if you will forgive me. Certainly. Stay together, ladies. Stay together, ladies. I've got a nice little surprise for you. This way. My ladies, this way, ladies. Oh, so come along. Here we are. <laughs> All nice and cozy. The master will be with us presently. I beg your pardon, sir? Yes? You said it was to be a party. That's right, miss. A little party. A little private party with lots of choice food and wine. <laughs> but didn't you say something about the gold? Yeah, that I did. There will be a piece of gold for every single one of you. And for the lucky one, even more gold. The lucky one? Yeah, that's right, the lucky one. How charming to meet you, ladies. It was good of you to accept my invitation. I trust we will all enjoy one another's company tonight. Wine is a wondrous bounty, a blessing. There is a wine for every mood. There is champagne, gay and carefree. Then there's claret, full-bodied and richly satisfying. Then we have the wine of Portugal, dark and sensuous and thick as blood. As with wine, so with women. This way. So, so, that's it. That's it. So. For every mood. Dark, saucy, slender, buxom, 
and fair. And for tonight, this one. Pay the others and dismiss them. Yes, master. Come, ladies, this way. Come on, come on, come on, come on. No, no, not you. You stay here. I fear the long journey has fatigued me more than I thought, Maud. I, I think I should retire. Of course, Robert. I understand. And Robert. Yes? You are right. Your presence here is most urgent to my well-being. Most urgent. But what? Not now. Good night. Good night, Maud. You are a very pretty little thing. Thank you, sir. And, and a very shy little thing. Well, sir, I never known a fine gentleman like yourself, sir. Do you find me pleasant? Oh, yes, sir. Only... Only what? Well, sir, you would be much more pleasant without that funny mask. A nice little girl. understand you are young you do not yet have daughters now that you are here sir maybe the experimenting will stop i'm a man of all words sir when my master says kral do this thing i do the thing whatever it may be Urgent to my well being. Most urgent to my well being. Most urgent. Most urgent. Most urgent. I have known a ghoul, a disgusting creature who opens graves and feeds on corpses. Good morning, Sir Robert. Ah, oh, good morning. May I know your preference for breakfast? Oh, anything at all. It's... Can you bring me a mirror? A mirror, Sir Robert? Yes, yeah, so that I can shave. I fear there are no mirrors. No mirrors? None in the entire castle. The Baron's orders. Hmm, but why not? <laughs> it is not my place to question. Will you be coming down to breakfast soon? Ah, uh, yes, presently. Very good, sir. Good morning, madam. Good morning. May I come in? 
Well, I... Do not worry. I am not a man who is affectionate in the morning hours. This morning, I intend to tell him everything. Yes, that's right. You were interrupted last night, weren't you? By your visitors. That is correct. What was she like? The one who screamed? Do not let us have a scene, madam. I merely wish to inform you that this morning your precious Sir Robert will know all. And he will make his decision this morning. If he decides wrongly, you will know what to expect from me. No, you wouldn't. Oh, but I would. I would indeed. Therefore, madam, it would be in your best interest to persuade Sir Robert to come to the right decision. How persuade him? How do women usually persuade men? Exactly what do you imply, sir? Imply? Cowards imply. I command. And I command you to sway him by any and every means in your power. Use your... I believe they're usually referred to as charms. Ah. Uh. Oh. And that pain, madam, was only a sample. I thought perhaps you might care to walk in my garden before breakfast. It's a strange garden. There are no flowers. Ah, yes. Flowers grow poorly here. Only Earth's ugly children flourish, the weeds. Here you will find those plants you read about in romantic tales. Wolfbane, mandrake root, hemlock, deadly nightshade. They are all here. Krull will be announcing breakfast shortly, and I thought perhaps in the interim we might talk a little. Uh, shall we be seated? Yes, I would like to speak to you of several matters. Perhaps I might resume my little story of the ghoul. Baron, there are other things I'd like to speak of first. Strange screams in the night and other sounds. A young girl tortured by leeches. Ah, yes, Sir Robert, you are right to question these things. But if you will listen to my story, you will learn all. You will learn the answer to these mysteries. You will also learn how low a human being can sink. You will learn the story of my first wife, who died because of a ghoul. My name was not always Sardonicus, and I did not always wear a mask. I was a simple peasant named Marek and my mother had been dead only a year. Ah, oh, Hendrik. It's only you and your son. We've come to pay our respects to my wife. She was a good woman. I bet I never walked the earth. My eyes are not what they were. And when I saw two men standing over a grave at dusk, well, as a grave digger, I have certain responsibilities, and I thought perhaps... You thought uh, what, my friend? You may have been those lowest of men, if you can call them men. Oh, you mean the... Uh, yes, the ghouls. But these are stories to scare children. Ah, oh, no, young Marek. Ask your father here. We old ones know that ghouls exist. We have seen them prowl at night and open the graves of our loved ones. Creatures that once were men, even as you and I, sunk so low that they do that. You are upsetting my son. Come, Mary, let's go home now. Your wife, Elenka, will be waiting for you. And I have a present for her. Marek, never fear. I will guard your mother well against the ghouls. They will never violate her grave. But what kind of present do you have for Elenka, Father? Oh, wait and see. She is so fond of pretty clothes and trinkets, things I cannot afford to give her. I know, I know. That is why I... Oh, Elenka. Well, there you are. Took you long enough. Is our meal ready, Elenka? I have eaten. You can heat up what's left. It doesn't matter. I'm not hungry. Oh, Elenka, my little one. What? When I was in the city yesterday, I bought something for you. Something that might make you very happy. You did? Yes, let me see. 
No, of course. I wore that lovely waistcoat my wife made for me before she died. It's in the pocket. I'll get it. But what is it? But what is it? Be patient. Here it is. Father, a lottery ticket again. Yes, but uh, uh, this one is... It is different, I know. Yes, it is different. You silly old man! How many lottery tickets have you bought in your life? Many. Perhaps hundreds. And how many times have you won? <laughs> Never, but this time... Uh... That's what you always say. This time. Oh, yes, I know, I know. But this time is truly different. Um, I feel it here, because this time... This time it's for you and Marek. Thank you, Father. I have never heard of anything so ridiculous. It was the last time I saw my father alive. For that very night, peacefully in his sleep, he left us. that followed were hard. Elenka and I continued to quarrel, and always over the same thing, money. Ah, oh, what's the use? It always comes out the same. I sell our produce in the city and then spend all the profit on feed and seed grain. And... You could get a good price for the farm. What, sell my father's farm? No. But even if I did, what then? We could go to the city and rent a big house. And the money would be gone in half a year. A half a year of luxury, yes! It would be better than this. Yes, who is it? Marek, open up. Open up. Yonku. Marek, my old friend. <laughs> Your friend is drunk. <laughs> I drunk? Just have three or four glasses. Three or four glasses. You've been to the city, Yonku. Yes, I have been to the city, and I have great news for you. Great news for my old friend. What news? News of money. Money? Yes, money. Lots and lots of money. For heaven's sake, man, what do you mean? <laughs> I mean this. Oh, what is it? <laughs> the winners. The winners. Yes, the lottery. The lottery winners. The lottery? Yes, you see here, there's a number. And there's your father's name. And next to it, you see the number. Seven, seven, zero, seven. Seven, seven, zero, seven. But that's right, that was it. Why, you, you mean your father's name? Yes, the language has <gasps> one hundreds, maybe thousands. Mark, Mark, how glorious. Tomorrow morning at dawn, I'll go to the city. I'll redeem the... What is it? The ticket. Where is the ticket? Marek. Marek, what is it? The waistcoat. What waistcoat? My father's. What about it? The waistcoat, the one my mother made for him. What about the waistcoat? He was buried in it. What difference does it make? The ticket. What? The lottery ticket was in the pocket. Marek, uh, I'll go now. Mark? Yeah? Did you say the lottery ticket was in the pocket? Yeah. Uh-uh. Not was, Mark. Is. 
The lottery ticket is in the pocket. What do you say? It's as clear as daylight. What do you say? Mark, it's the only way. May God forgive you. You have said that you love me. This is your chance to prove it. Please, Lenka, don't put it like that. Prove it! And so that night, Sir Robert, I became a profaner of the dead, a robber of graves, a ghoul. What I had not foreseen was that the face of my father, the muscles stretched by a terrible death recall, would look directly and hideously upon me, the dead lips drawn back in a constant and soul-shattering smile. Suddenly I realized I had not performed my ghastly mission. The lottery ticket remained in my father's pocket. Something wrong. Wait, I light the candle. Merciful God. Ever since that night, Sir Robert, my face has been as you see it now. A replica of my dead father's. The lips drawn back in a perpetual mocking grin. I have never been able to close my mouth. The muscles are immovable, as if held in the rigor of death. Incredible. And yet your power of speech does not seem to have been impaired. Ah, but it was, Sir Robert, very much impaired. For a long time, I could hardly speak at all. 
Only through arduous training by the finest teachers of diction in the world did I finally master the art of utilizing dormant muscles of the throat and palate. I literally learned to speak all over again. Through the years, I have evolved a kind of explanation for my strange affliction. At first, of course, my superstitious peasant mind believed that heaven had placed a curse upon me to punish me for violating my father's rest, or that some devilish force from beyond the grave had reached out to stamp my face. But at length, I began to believe it was the massive shock that forced my face to this state, and that my great guilt had also helped to shape it, even as my dead father's face was shaped. Shock and guilt. Strong powers, not from God above, nor the fiend below, but from within my own heart, my own brain, my own soul. But your wife, Elenka? She died by her own hand. But you did redeem the lottery ticket? Obviously, and bought myself the resounding title of Baron. And your new name? Oh, come, Sir Robert, you are a medical man. Surely you recognize the term Sardonicus. Yes, the Latin term for the grimace on the faces of lockjaw victims. Rhesus sardonicus. Sardonic smile. Of course. In my blighted condition, I began to take a great interest in the medical arts. I read a great deal. In the course of my reading, I came across that Latin term. The bitter irony of it appealed to me, and I took sardonicus as my name. Does my story answer your questions? It answers many questions. The strange sounds of eating that I heard. I can eat only the thinnest stews and porridges, sucking them up like a beast. The sight is so offensive that I always eat alone. The leeches? I tried everything. In my despair, I allowed Krull to test an ancient folk remedy on the girl. And the mirrors? If you had my face, Sir Robert, your house would be devoid of mirrors too. Yes, I understand that. And you understand now why I have brought you here? Of course, because you heard of my researches. And your successes, Sir Robert. The successes that earned you a knighthood. I have visited famous doctors all over the world. Kelo in Berlin, Morignac in Paris, Buonagenti in Milan. They are all great men. But none have been able to help me. None. You are my last hope, Sir Robert. I beseech you to help me. To lift this curse from me. To make me look once more like a man that I may take my place among my fellow human beings as one of them, rather than as a gargoyle to be shunned and feared and ridiculed. You were right to ask me, Baron. We must never abandon hope. I can begin treatment this afternoon. Hey, come on, come on, hurry up. Put it there. Robert. Maud. Cure him. Oh, cure him, Robert. Fail, I will suffer. A devoted wife could feel no other way. No, you, you don't understand. If you do not heal him, you will punish me. Surely you wouldn't beat you. I wish he would be content with a mere beating. His cleverness knows a more hideous torture. But this is monstrous. I shall demand that he... No, no, say nothing. If you do, he may embellish the punishment. But what manner of... No, say nothing. He's waiting for you. Yes, Sir Robert. Remain here. I will need your assistance. Yes, sir. What form will the treatment take? Repeated applications of heat and special massage. These have been tried and failed. Massage differs from one pair of hands to another. I've had success with my own techniques and I have faith in them. Share my faith. I do. I must. Let us begin. 
over the mask. Charles? seconds crowd. No more, no less. Yes, sir. Thirty seconds, Sir Robert. What remains to be done? Nothing. I won't deceive you. I've done all I can. It's hopeless. I can do no more. There must be more. I'm sorry. Resume the treatment. That will be futile. I've worked most of the day and into the night. Leave us, Krull. Surely there are other treatments. None that have been sufficiently tested. None that I would venture to use on a human being. Ah, then other possibilities do exist. No, they're still in the experimental stages. Doctor, I implore you to use whatever treatments that remain, however untried they may be. They are fraught with danger, Baron. Danger of what? I am ready to gamble with my life. But I am not willing to gamble your life. So, Robert, I will offer you 10,000 crowns. This is not a question of money, Baron. 20,000, 30,000, whatever you may desire. No. Very well. Then I must ask you to come with me. Where are you taking me? Patience, Sir Robert, patience. All will be made clear to you soon. This castle is very old, Sir Robert. It was built in a dim age of fearful barbarity. This is the torture chamber of the castle. done to her? Nothing. Yet. You must know, first of all, that I am the victim of a little domestic tragedy. My wife does not love me. She has always been a wife in name only. She is revolted, you see. Revolted by my face. It's not only that. Oh, come, madam. My crudeness, my cruelty, my arrogance. This is what you tell yourself in your womanish fashion, is it not? But it is my face you buy your door against, not my character flaws. If I am pushed to the limits of my endurance, Sir Robert, if you do not cure me, I shall be forced to make myself acceptable to my wife by an extreme measure. You would torture her? That would gain me nothing. 
I merely wish to detain my wife in this chair while she undergoes a little surgery. Surgery? Yes, surgery which will make her more sympathetic to my plight. And for this purpose, I have enlisted the services of a man who excels at surgery. You mean me? No, no. Someone with quite different talents. In point of fact, he stands behind me. Krull? But he's no man of medicine. I'm a man of old work, sir. When my master says, Krull, do this thing, I do the thing, whatever it may be. I seem to remember you saying, Sir Robert, that this was most commendable. What devilish surgery do you plan? Something quite simple, really. The resorious muscle, that which controls the act of smiling. A few deft incisions with a sharp knife, and Maud will look like me. No! That lovely face will resemble mine. And when her own beauty is transformed into hideousness, when she herself is a monster shunned by humankind, how can she then bar her door to me? Krull, begin. Forgive me for tying you to the rack, Sir Robert, but I assure you, I do not wish to break your bones. I simply felt it was the best vantage point for you to watch the operation. I did not, of course, wish to proceed while you were still unconscious. That would have been most impolite. Don't do it, Sardonicus. Don't do it, I beg of you. Ah, you beg, just as I begged above in my chambers, do you recall? I begged you to try the new treatment on me, and you refused. Crow, you may begin. Master. Yes? Yeah. I have done many things for you. Things out of nightmares. But her face? What about her face, Crow? It is so beautiful. Are you quite certain? Yes, I'm quite certain. Don't tell me, Crowell, that you object. I only meant... Because you well know what happens to people who raise objections to my acts. You know what happened the single time you questioned my authority many years ago. Or have you forgotten that once you had two eyes? No, I have not forgotten. Then begin. Destroy her face! <laughs> Stop it! Stop it, Crow! <laughs> Sardonicus. I'll, I'll do whatever you say. Release the Baroness, Krull. And then release our honored guest here. You have made a very wise decision, Sir Robert. Robert. Mm -hmm. Can you really cure him? Dangerous, untried treatment. We shall have to send for drugs and equipment from far off places.
have asked not to be disturbed. Are you making progress? Perhaps. I saw a krull and a dog. You'll see many such dogs before I'm finished, Baron. Doctor, are you preparing a cure or a poison? Sometimes they're one and the same thing. I warn you that if you do not succeed... warnings don't frighten me anymore, Baron. Then I demand an explanation. Very well. This tropical plant is known as Strictness toxifera. Centuries ago, the explorer Magellan wrote of a substance used on darts by the natives of South America. It killed instantly, dropping large animals in their tracks. The poison was extracted from this plant. And this is your so-called treatment? There are many varieties of poison, some killed by corrosive action. But this, this kills by bringing about a total relaxation of the muscles, particularly the muscles of the lungs and heart. And when they stop, life stops. However, of recent months, I have asked myself whether a dilution of this deadly poison might not beneficially slacken the rigidly tense muscles of paralyzed patients. It was only a theory, and a flimsy one at that. Much too dangerous to be used on a human being. I see. I'm afraid a long period of research lies ahead of me, Baron. I wouldn't want to fail. That is correct, Sir Robert. See to it that you do succeed. I love this music. It's exquisite, but sad. Yes, but there's strength under the sadness. That was very beautiful, Maud. You and your music are the only beautiful things in this place. Maud, I never asked you why... Why I married him? It's not a very pretty story. My father, as you know, made all the arrangements by letter, without having met the Baron face to face. Then we sailed for the continent to seal the agreement. But surely after meeting this brute? Oh, yes. Even my father, who worshipped money, changed his mind upon meeting the Baron. But my father had gambled heavily and was sunken in debt. He'd even misused certain funds that were entrusted to him. The Baron offered him both a reward and a threat. Yes, the Baron is fond of threats. He offered to pay all my father's debts. And he also threatened to expose him as an embezzler. So your father forced you into this unsavory alliance? No. The choice was mine. I did it to save him. Oh, my dear. Ah, what a charming tableau. Sir Robert. Yes? Krull informs me that today a dog seemed to survive your injection. Krull is a reliable informant. Then the extract of the poisonous plant has been made safe. Apparently, but I need a few more days. A few more days? Why, if the dog lives? Men are not dogs, Baron. I must be certain. I am certain enough for both of us. Doctor, I insist that you perform the treatment tonight. But the risk is too great. I refuse. Madam, take this. But why? The room upstairs. Open it. But you allow no one except yourself to open that door. Tonight, I'm prepared to make an exception. Will you go? We will follow. Open it. Go in. Do not be afraid.
Someone's in here. I sense it. Someone's in here. I know it. Why do you just stand there? Who are you? What's happening to her? Who's in there with her? Poor girl. Perhaps it was a shock seeing him for the first time. My reminder of earthly greed and mortality. My nemesis. My demon. My father whose grave I defiled. Damn you, Sardonicus. Damn you to eternal hell. You have no decency in you, no human feeling. As usual, Sir Robert, you speak with unwavering accuracy. Life has erased all decency and human feeling from my heart. It is for you to restore it tonight in your laboratory. And if I refuse? Then Maud stays here all night with him. Very well. Tonight. What is that strange instrument? A new invention called a hypodermic needle. The South American natives use this extract to poison their darts. You might say this instrument is my dart. I must warn you again, Baron, this distillment has never been used on a human subject. It may kill you. I urge you for the last time not to insist upon its use. You seek to frighten me, Doctor, to plant distrust in my heart. No, no, Baron. But theoretically speaking, what is to prevent me from injecting the undiluted poison into your blood and killing you here and now? Three things. First, your silly code of ethics as an English knight. Second, the sanctimonious oath of your profession. And thirdly, thirdly, the knowledge that if I die, Krull has orders to put both you and my wife to the slowest and most hideous of deaths in the torture chamber below. And I accept your terms, Baron. Now, will you please come with me? Where are we going? Into your past, Baron. Into your youth. Lord, you needn't come in. May we have some light, please, Krull? Now, will you be good enough to sit in this chair, Baron? I do not understand all this, Doctor. Then I'll explain while Krull ties you in the chair. What? Just for your own good, there may be a violent reaction. Krull. There is a healing of the flesh and a healing of the spirit. You have said, Baron, that shock was the factor that brought your face to its present condition. Do you remember? Yes then perhaps shock may be your cure. Shock combined with medical science. You speak in riddles. Medical science. Shock. Do you think that thing can shock me now? I have lived with it for many years. We shall see. As you're alone in that grave years ago. How long? As long as is necessary. Carl?
No. Not like this. Not like this! Not in the dark! Not in the dark! Not like this! Let him out! Let him out! Let him out! All my work. But he's suffering. That needle. You are poisoning him. You are killing him. Not in the dark! Ah! Do not touch him, Crow. No, Baron. Do not speak. The muscles of your face are so relaxed it is beyond your power to move your lips. If you were to attempt it now, it would destroy all our good work. This condition will pass in a few minutes. On time. By this document and by the power invested in me as a baronic lord of the land, I do irrevocably and forever annul my marriage with one who was no wife to me and for whom I now have neither need nor use, Sardonicus. You have fulfilled your part of the bargain. Name your fee, for I owe you much. No, Baron, you owe me nothing. You're in luck, sir. The train leaves in less than one hour. Oh, thank you. Sir Robert. I thought we'd seen the last of you, Krull. You must return, Sir Robert. He needs you. Impossibly, we would miss the train. But you do not understand. He cannot open his mouth. Nonsense. But it's true. He cannot speak, he cannot eat or drink. I'm a strong man. With my own two hands, I tried to pry his jaws apart, but I could not. He'll, he'll starve, he'll die horribly. He will not die, Crow. You must tell him simply that he can open his mouth himself. But you are his healer. I did not heal him. The fluid I injected into his face was nothing more than distilled water. Water? 
but the tropical plant, all the experiments, all the dogs. An elaborate show, nothing more. The dogs did not die, they were merely drugged. I had to make the Baron think that I was preparing a new and powerful medication. I still do not understand. Go to him, Crow. Remind him of something he said to me once. That his affliction came not from God above, nor from the fiend below, but from within his own heart, his own brain, his own soul. His cure came from within him too. What he needs? All he needs is the knowledge that he was his own healer. Without that, he is doomed. Yes, yes. Oh, I see. Then go at once and tell him. Yes, I will. True, Robert, that the medication was nothing more than water? Nothing more. You see, I knew that after all the best massaging techniques of the world's foremost physicians had failed, I would have to work not on the Baron's physical self, but on his mental self. Then the South American plant really wasn't poisonous? Oh, yes, very poisonous. Much too poisonous to use. Someday, perhaps, its powers may be harnessed for the good of mankind, but that day is not yet. And so I did not use an extract of the plant at all. Only water. Only water. And his own mind. And that's how the story ends. With the lovers living happily ever after. But has Mr. Sodonicus been punished enough? Or don't you agree with me that such a miserable scoundrel should be made to suffer and suffer and suffer? When you think what he did to his wife, and to those girls, and about those leeches, I think ordinary punishment is too good for Mr. Sidonicus. If you feel that way too, if you want to show him no mercy and punish him as he deserves, then hold up your punishment poll ballot with the thumb pointing down, like this. If, on the other hand, uh, you're one of those I-wouldn't-hurt-a-fly kind of people. One of those sweet, nice, kind souls uh, who would let Mr. Sidonicus go free. You should hold your ballad with the thumb pointing up, like this. And now we're ready for the voting. No mercy or mercy. Hold the ballads high, please. Oh, come now. Hold them up, please. Oh, that's better. Uh, the lady in the ninth row, a little higher. Uh -huh. The little boy in the back, will you please sit down so I can count the cards behind you? Uh, that young couple on the left, is that one vote or two that you're casting? Two votes? Uh, thank you. Thank you all very much. Hmm. Mercy, no mercy. Seventeen. Carry the three. Subtract 40. No mercy. So be it. You have given the verdict. You have made the decision, and the majority of you have sentenced Mr. Sardonicus to further punishment. Mr. Projectionist, let the sentence be carried out.